Romania is, is one of the biggest beneficiaries of the modernization fund. It has already deployed 2.9 billion to uh, increase the modernization and accelerating good practices uh, in the Romanian economy. And what we see very often is uh, not just in Romania, but in many of the member states, when you go to the local level, the administrative capacity is being pulled left, right and center into different directions. They may have uh, you know, a big office of some 30 people, but only one person is in charge of sustainability criteria or whatever. And that person may not be only working on that. And sometimes we do get the sense that uh, there is a little bit of a disconnect between the local and regional authorities authorities and what is being proposed by the national authorities as the priorities. So the enthusiasm and eagerness at the level of mayors to do something does not get trickled up to the national level and then it doesn't get translated or identified in the priorities that are put forward to Brussels. Mm -hmm. If we as policymakers don't take maximum effort to protect our citizen against the already devastating impacts of climate change, we're not doing our job. So we need to step up our game in uh, enhancing preparedness and resilience of our economy and society at face of the impacts of climate change. I think uh, part of DG Klima job description is relentless optimism. And uh, for us to spread that optimism around, I think we need to learn to communicate better. There's a lot of disinformation being deployed. Uh, combating that disinformation is going to be very important and a big challenge. Uh, also, what we sometimes feel is that the, the challenge is felt to be so overwhelming that you get a reaction that's not denialism, but defeatism. And we cannot afford that defeatism because that would create a, a kind of depression across the society. I'm very content to have today in our Green Report podcast a special guest directly from Brussels arrived into Bucharest for an important climate summit that we are organizing over here and directly from the European Commission. Welcome to the Green Report podcast, Elena Drum from Head of the International Relation in DG Klima. Uh, it sounds uh, very complicated usually for the majority of people say DG Klima, trans, envy and everything. Mm. It's, uh, it's very hap I'm very happy to have you here in Bucharest and to talk with you about environmental policies. Because in general for the majority of the people, when say policy is something out there, it comes with a lot of obligations usually for the countries and then they don't understand it at the level of the grassroots. Well, how does it impact it? So I would really love to start a discussion with you to give us a little bit of a hint about what does European climate and environmental legislation mean and what are you in fact doing at the European um, Commission's level for this and then lately but surely going also into the Green Deal. Okay. Thanks very much for the question and thanks very much for having me here. And I uh, have to say that it's my second time in Bucharest and I'm, I'm enjoying it thoroughly. The weather, of course, helps, unusually warm as it may be. And uh, the Climate Change Summit, the organizers have done an impeccable job in bringing together such a great uh, participation uh, and uh, so much enthusiasm around this agenda. Uh, climate and environment protection have long-standing roots in the European treaties. There are specific articles and EU has always been not only committed to multilateralism but also to sustainability. So we have quite extensive legislation already, uh, water directives, we have nature uh, directives, bird life and, and so forth. And we're increasingly trying to integrate these sustainability considerations to legislation across the board. Now, my DG, the department that deals with climate action, has a little bit more of an economic approach to the matters. For instance, one of our key policy instruments is the emissions trading scheme, which actually uh, puts a cap on emissions from industrial installations, particularly the uh, energy intensive industries, thereby encouraging them to reach performance standards that allow them to operate within that cap while the cap is being lowered. For all the emissions that go over that cap, they need to buy, they need to purchase emissions rights, so they have a strong commercial interest to reduce their emissions. 
to well, remain competitive. To remain competitive. What we also do is that all the auctioning revenues that come from the purchasing of these allowances are used by the member states, hopefully to encourage more modern practices and uh, innovation, as well as investment into low carbon technologies. You said hopefully. How is it in Romania, for example? With a, what will be a country which really use it in a correct manner and encourage the industry to really develop new technology, innovation, and also have better climate response? And uh, what are stories that we can learn out of from? Well, it's it's clear that you know the member states as budget authorities, because the revenues are theirs, mm -hmm. they they have uh, legitimate claims and other priorities to use. So, in so far as legal binding we have not circumvented any, with the exception that we take aside now as own resources, specific funds for what's called the Innovation Fund, what's called the Modernization Fund, and the Social Climate Fund. So there are funding instruments that target specific needs of specific countries. Let's take the example of Romania. Romania is, is one of the biggest beneficiaries of the modernization fund, it has already deployed 2.9 billion to uh, increase the modernization and accelerating good practices uh, in the Romanian economy. And if all the transfers are also taken into use from the auctioning allowances, we could be looking at a, a pool of some 40 billion um, euros with the current uh, allowance prices, so what you pay for the units of the credits. But usually when we talk about these funds, and this is not the only one that you refer, but we see in the European, on the European Commission level we talk about different kind of uh, funds, yeah. especially the ones uh, now towards the Green Deal and all this money. It sounds for the common uh, citizen something very, very far away. Because there are talks about billion, when you talk with Romanian politicians, they say there is never the, pro the problem of the money, but at the end of the day, it is the problem of the money, how they arrive over here. So how could we, in fact, uh, see the role of the European Commission also in funneling the funds in a correct manner so that we really have projects that deliver to the actual goals that we are having? Yeah. Well, let's take, for instance, the recovery funds um, that have been uh, mm -hmm. now put to play. Uh, the recovery and resilience funds that are available uh, are deployed on a basis of a recovery and resilience plan, which has to be put together by the Romanian authorities. In that, however, we have made certain conditions, such as the do no significant harm principle and a specific threshold for climate uh, you know, and uh, sustainable development uh, compatible projects. So all the recovery and resilience plans are screened by the Commission for their ability to deliver also on the Green Deal and the digital transformation objectives. So when deploying the funds, the European Commission actively encourages wise use of those funds, what we like to refer to as build back better. So when you recover, when you heal the economy, you also make sure that it's sustainable and durable for the future. But unfortunately, I see exactly this in some projects on, on Romanian level, authorities, local authorities level. We look at the sustainable urban mobility plans and also the wish of the majority of the mayors to do now sustainable transportation. For them, normally it's meant to, to change the, uh, the fleet of public transport with electrical vehicles, to invest in subways in different cities and so on and so on. But because of the commission is coming with a lot of checklists, you need to have more sustainable transport means also pedestrian and cyclist prioritization. They also are obliged to do it. And I'm, I'm seeing rather not necessary visionary projects, or I see projects where it's so much bigger in terms of the need of the city. I talk about the bike share system, the way it is thought about the implementation, because there are money at the European level, or there are these resilience funds money. Mm -hmm. But the question is, how 
can we assure that the authority afterwards is really able to maintain the quality and the characteristic of the system? Because it's easy, they have the money for the investment, but they do not have the money for the forthcoming years of the operation of the system. Yeah, I think, you know, money should never be considered as a, as a sunk cost. And of course, for the implementation, you need to make sure that you have the necessary resources and that you have the necessary capacity. And what we see very often is uh, not just in Romania, but in many of the member states, when you go to the local level, the administrative capacity is being pulled left, right and center into different directions. They may have uh, you know, a big office of some 30 people, but only one person is in charge of sustainability criteria or whatever. And that person may not be only working on that. They may also be in charge of schools or childcare centers or what have you. So in order for us to pursue the right priorities, we need to also put our money where our mouth is in terms of the resources that we deploy. Uh, the EU offers some capacity building and, and project pipeline development work. But at the end of the day, the ownership needs to be at the base of where the projects are being deployed. I would also say that it's not only the recovery and resilience funds that we have at our disposal. We, of course, also have the cohesion funds and we have the common agriculture funds, which go to mm -hmm. a different, not necessarily for cities. But uh, they, too, can be harnessed with systematic planning to serve the purposes. And sometimes we do get the sense that uh, there is a little bit of a disconnect between the local and regional authorities and what is being proposed by the national authorities as the priorities. So the enthusiasm and eagerness at the level of mayors to do something does not get trickled up to the national level and then it doesn't get translated or identified in the priorities that are put forward to Brussels. But let me get even more up. I'm going back to the Commission, I'm going mm -hmm. back uh, to Brussels, where we have also the Parliament, which has to look into the legislation that is coming, but also the, the politics. I would like that you explain for our listeners and uh, the, those which are watching our podcast, how politics become implemented how they from where is the idea coming what is the process and how for example we take the green deal how that came alive yeah well i think green deal is a uh, manifestation of the public opinion if you recall uh, when we were having the last European elections, mm -hmm. that was right at the time when mm. Greta Thunberg and the Fridays for Future, there was the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change 1.5 degree report with some pretty shocking uh, data in it. And uh, it created a movement that then uh, was reflected in the European Parliament debate. The Green Party was very strong. And in order to secure uh, the majority vote, our political uh, you know, leaders needed to reflect that in the identification of the priorities for the current commission. One of those priorities was the Green Deal. How do we deliver to the future generations uh, whilst not compromising the industrial competitiveness of today's generations? And the Green Deal is, is a comprehensive package of some 50 uh, initiatives, projects, measures, regulations across all sectors of economy. So it's by no means about environment and climate. It's about energy. It's about infrastructure. It's about forest. It's about agriculture. It's about health. It's food production, a circular economy. So there is no part of the commission that's not involved somehow in deploying all of the Green Deal. So it's really become our new growth strategy. And more than that, when we had the COVID crisis, because we had those plans in place, it became a recovery strategy. But uh, when we talk about strategy, it's a long-term commitment on the politics, but politics is also changing. Mm -hmm. And we see that now we are preparing for a new election next year in the European Parliament. And... Um, the, the polls are showing that it might show up a bit different, not that the Greens have the majority or pushing much more on the European environmental agenda, but the right wing and seems that will uh, have much more votes and much more seats in the parliament than, the, than we, we expect, let's say like this. Uh, is it uh, any threat that this agenda and this strategy of the Green Deal will be changed with the new commission? Well, I think if, if you uh, look at it in a little bit more diagnostic way, 
you can see that there are different elements of the Green Deal. Some of the, the uh, say, conservationist uh, initiatives that have been seen as a, a somehow a luxury item or an add-on have become more and more difficult to to. Uh, introduce when people are struggling with inflation, with cost of living, energy prices, the uncertainties that we have around geopolitics. So they come to the forefront of people's preoccupation. And that's reflected also in the priority identification of, of uh, politicians. At the same time, there is a you know legally binding commitment to a net zero uh, economy, net zero emissions economy by 2050. And we also have uh, very strong evidence of the green agenda when it comes to energy transition and climate change, helping us achieve energy independence from fossil fuels and in particular of Russia. Of course, we would like to be energy independent from other rogue players as well. And it seems to be that many of the oil producing partners actually are very unstable uh, partners. And, uh, you know, therefore uh, trusting and investing into our own supply sources makes economic sense. And, and that too enjoys strong support. So is politics, in fact, on correctly f uh, framing the topics? Because when I talk with somebody which is like, let's say, from a Green Party, they have the understanding from the Environment Part. If I talk somebody, let's say, like, uh, center-right or like this, it's more the economical and uh, social uh, aspects. Uh, and then to the other premises of policies, we can say, okay, there are different kind of aspects, but we always can frame correctly our intention for, cl for climate fight, let's say, like this. Well, I think, you know, it's it's both an economic but also a societal imperative. Mm -hmm. If we as policymakers don't take maximum effort to protect our citizen against the already devastating impacts of climate change, we're not doing our job. So we need to step up our game in uh, enhancing preparedness and resilience of our economy and society at face of the impacts of climate change. So prevention, adaptation, being able to cope with the consequences, whilst at the same time we need to continue to uh, build our competitiveness in what inevitably will be a net zero marketplace as we move along. And how we, do you do this by embracing and taking all the stakeholders uh, with you on the way? And with stakeholders being not only the politician part, but also, of course, the industry, the NGOs, the media, because you need all of them. Yeah. Well, we are embarking in lots of efforts with the industry uh, in different types of uh, sectoral roundtables. For instance, we have one on hydrogen, we will have one on wind, we will have so, so really taking them around. But it's not only about the low carbon industry, it's also about the steel producers, the heavy uh, emitting industries, where we need to provide solutions and alternatives to heavily emitting uh, practices. And uh, it is, a, it is a very complicated mosaic of interests, but when we have a narrative and we have predictability that allows the investors to anticipate and make the right type of strategic choices, I think we are moving forward. And if I may add to that, I also think that uh, some of the things that have been perceived as luxury items, you know, environmental protection or what have you, at the end of the day, they are very important in the overall equation of us pursuing this societal uh, resilience. Because if you take, for instance, nature-based solutions, it's not only about conservation, it's only about preservation, preserving our ways of living. Because uh, water reservoirs, as an example, can act as a really important cushion when you have floods, so they're water reservoirs, but they can also have a sponge function that when you have droughts, they can release uh, water to uh, agriculture and to the very vanished forest industry as well. But as you correctly stated, the majority of the consumer or the citizens of Europe see it as a luxury program. They said on the one hand, we said, yes, we are in climate crisis. We cannot afford not to do mm. anything. But on the other hand, I'm not willing to pay for this. And we see it, for example, when we buy ourselves a plane ticket where the majority of the airlines already have right now on the mm. website that you have the choice to pay more with three or six or 10 euros, depending on the how long your route is. 
for a net zero flight. Mm. And I was uh, asking the aviation companies how many of their normal clients are really pressing the button paying by themselves this. And it's unfortunately a very small number. So it consider it's, it's nice to have, but let me not pay for it. How difficult is it from the European Commission to translate these messages for the in- individual in our own households? I think I, I would put it quite simply. Um, <clears throat> You have a kind of timeline uh, where you either pay for damages and recovery, where it's not going to be an investment, it's a cost, or you pay for prevention. So by reducing emissions or or by uh, building up resilience, in that case, it's an investment. Because if you pay for recovery, you always end up paying more and more. So let's take the, the... fires in Greece, the, the floods in Slovenia, huge efforts, huge uh, funding from, from different uh, recovery and disaster mechanisms has gone there, and these are being depleted very quickly. Whereas if you had up front had the preventative mechanism, the flood management, etc. in place, they would have helped us reduce, maybe completely eliminate the damages, and they would still be there. So that's an investment that will keep on adding value, whereas when you pay for recovery, it's a sunk cost. Nevertheless, absolutely correct, but nevertheless, how you explain countries which were, let's say, economically not so far developed, like Western European countries, which were polluting because there were not this kind of emission tradings, there were not these barriers of emission. Now you can say you cannot develop your industry so much or you have to invest so much in the innovation part and there are so many criteria. But uh, the people over here would like also to have the same kind of uh, living and expectation of being able to, to put, let's say, negative uh, impact on the environment if the other could do it. How can we explain it and how can we make uh, developing countries be part of this important uh, plan? Well, I think uh, the best way to inspire action, to get people to follow uh, the, the pathway to net zero carbon, is to show that it can be done. That you can decouple growth from the growth of emissions by deploying the right types of technologies, by investing in research and innovation. And that type of investment actually builds up your competitiveness for the future. Because if you continue to invest into coal or, or you know, use soon to be redundant technologies that are high intensity in carbon, you face a huge problem of stranded assets because those assets will not be relevant in the future that we foresee. And and that has been uh, already enshrined into the uh, Paris Agreement and and as a a long-term direction of travel. And we're seeing that uh, happen in in countries that are oil producing, such as Saudi Arabia, where huge effort is being invested into diversification of the energy mix, you know, solar uh, and wind, instead of oil in order to build their economic model so that it corresponds with the more contemporary realities. But you have been also part in a negotiation team from the European mm-hmm. Commission uh, to, to, together with the, for the Romanian government. And uh, I would like to ask you what was the expertise that you got over here? How is the Romanian government dealing and approaching the, 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 the targets that we are having on the on European level? And how are they fighting for them? At, at European level, um, our targets are, of course, those of emission reduction targets. But the Romanian government and the negotiators that I had the privilege to work with Uh, we're also very committed to the global targets, which stands for the two degrees uh, and pursuing efforts to stay within 1.5 degrees. And those are kind of the compass of the action for international community. And the way we work in as the EU is that uh, all the 27 member states appoint negotiators that participate into the team EU and they t- team up with the European Commission experts, such as myself, to to have a a base or a team EU uh, of experts that works together and speaks with one voice in the international negotiations. So so when I worked with the Romanian presidents of the European Council, it it was a very harmonious relationship. But of course, 
all the member states have their own uh, reservations, own points of interest. And I think that's one of the things that makes the EU so strong in the negotiations is that we have already inside found them. compromises inside. We have rehearsed our arguments. We have found a way forward. And that way forward this year was just sealed by the environment ministers on Monday when they convened in Luxembourg to avo uh, agree the negotiation position and the objectives for the COP28 in Abu Dhabi later. This year. What will be the biggest challenge, if I would say, uh, being in DG climate, talking and negotiating different kind of targets with each country, uh, out of your experience, what are the biggest challenges? Well, biggest, the uh, very big challenges are, of course, the, the kind of notion of historic responsibility, you know, the, the kind of north-south divide and somehow the bifurcation. Uh, between least developed countries and, and developing countries and industrialized countries. What I think we, we need to accept is that, um, you know, uh, while of course it's very comfortable for, for some of the emerging economies to refer to themselves as they were in 1990s. Much easier, level yeah. much down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That there is a, a kind of collective realization that without the partnership, without the commitment of those countries, we will not be able to solve this problem. And that pressure is not just coming from the EU, that pressure is also coming from the uh, small island states and the least developed countries who have indeed contributed the least to the problem, but are practically facing the inundation of their islands as the sea levels rise. So it is a much more nuanced uh, landscape of emissions profiles and geopolitical interests than it was in the 1990s. And anyone who, who exercises intellectual honesty, independent of where they come in the world, will see that. We look uh, at the European market and we are used at the European level to have a very good social standard. Mm. We expect that things are happening on our, in our governments, in our countries. But the reality is that our natural resources are disappearing, more or less. But our needs and our expectations are still here, which makes us to be vulnerable in uh, seeing how we get attract new raw materials or how we can do uh, the good recycling and a good commitment to reuse our resources. What is the policy the European Commission is having in regard of packaging, waste management and resources? Well, we very much believe in circular economy, so making best use of waste materials and also things such as urban mining. There's a lot of critical raw materials that are in the disposed uh, electronics, for instance, that can be taken better use of. And uh, there is now a lot of very solid encouragement for that, also from the regulatory basis. Natural resources, of course, that we face Uh, a situation where, where also food waste and and uh, you know the use of um, land are, are compromising that the kind of ways of managing these assets, natural resources are assets, and that's why uh, initiatives such as nature restoration law, which actually is not just about conservation, it's a very utilitarian approach, which allows us to build that resilience as economy uh, towards the future eventualities and also uh, the strategic stockpile for, for our um, kind of natural resources. Where is your positive approach? When we look about Europe and we talk about, uh, talk about climate, climate change, climate crisis mm -hmm. right now, where is your hope in politics? My hope in politics is really in, in uh, the, the kind of courage that we need to project and the fact that we have already pocketed lots of the successes, creating new jobs, creating a skills agenda, which will look forward, not backward. So uh, my hope is in recognition of the challenge and then much more decisive efforts that will take us somewhere Uh, that we can truly tell our children and they can tell their grandchildren that we were ahead of the game already when some of the world was still waiting and that we will keep that marketplace. I think uh, part of DG Klima job description is relentless optimism. 
And uh, for us to spread that optimism around, I think we need to learn to communicate better. Not only to communicate better, I believe, but also to understand the real risks around mm. and to find really good strategic approaches to minimize this risk. And if we talked about hope, uh, of course, I would like to also ask you which are the biggest challenge for the moment for the next five years? Well, you already referred to the political undercurrents. And I think it would be naive to say that everyone's cheering on, you know, with this and that agenda. Uh, there's a lot of disinformation being deployed. Mm -hmm. uh, combating that disinformation is going to be very important and a big challenge. Uh, also, what we sometimes feel is that the, the challenge is felt to be so overwhelming that you get a reaction that's not denialism, but defeatism. And we cannot afford that defeatism because that would create a, a kind of depression across the society. So we need to look at the incremental steps we continue to make towards the long-term direction and goal. And we need to work with those progressive partners that we have around the world and within the industry, without the, within the businesses, and really create a collaborative coalition of the progressives that can ensure the movement to the right direction. For the majority of the people, the European Commission, the Parliament, generally the whole institution at the European level are like in a bubble somewhere in Strasbourg, in Brussels. They are talking, they are making papers, a lot of papers translated in all these languages around the world that we are having, or not around the world, but at least in Europe. How can a simple citizen get more informed and more active involved in what happens at the European level? Well, I am here in Bucharest and I've spent much of my time talking to stakeholders, talking to people like yourself, talking to different uh, media in order to try and explain it. But more importantly than to try and explain, I've spent a lot of my time listening to stakeholders. Because if we're in the Brussels bubble, as you put it, if we don't understand the citizen, the society, to who we are regulating, to who we are trying to provide these objectives and policies and protection. If we don't understand the concern of the people, we're missing the uh, point. And at this time of the European project, our understanding of the people, of the population, of the stakeholders, our constituencies will be a make or break. So I will continue to, to listen, travel, Uh, go to places uh, and and particularly put emphasis on the countries where the challenges are the, the biggest. And I think uh, this is something that the college members also uh, are going to be doing in the coming months. In you know, our drama, I think that you will also maintain your positivism and optimism that you are uh, with which you came also to Bucharest in fulfilling all the agenda that you are having to do. Thank you so much for the for the dialogue. I hope you're good to have a good time over here, and also I uh, hope to see you in uh, other conferences soon enough in Bucharest. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to have been here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>